Beautiful. Uh, and I'm just going to go over a couple of housekeeping things with relation to how to use WebEx, just so that we can all participate fully and we're all on the same page. And then, and then we'll get started with our presentation here. So first, if you'd like to, you can turn on closed captioning by clicking that, that little CC button at the bottom left hand corner of your screen. You can also change how you're viewing this session uh, by clicking the layout button at the top right hand corner of your screen. You can raise your hand or do a thumbs up or smiley face or anything like that uh, with those buttons there at the bottom of your screen. But please note that in WebEx webinars, you can't unmute your own self. Uh, so if you have a question that you want to actually speak orally, please just raise your hand and I can unmute you. And finally, you can access the chat, um, as I said, in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, and Septap and Janine have kindly agreed to take questions throughout. So please just feel free to use the chat to do that. Uh, if you have a comment or question, or if you want to raise your hand, I'll keep an eye on all of that. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll turn it over to Septap and Janine. Okay. Right, I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Janine, all yours. Okay, so I am having a few technical difficulties with my camera today. So um, you can see me there on the screen. Sevtap kindly put my picture there. Um, I was kind of disappointed because I did pick out a special shirt for this occasion. So it's blue with yellow and it's really silky. So it's lovely. I'm sorry I didn't get to show it off. <laughs> Can change the slide, so tap, please. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Like I said, my name is Janine Taylor Cutting and together with SevTap, I'll be presenting about the public interest group on cancer research. I'm a cancer survivor myself and I live in central Newfoundland. Um, so that's my role, I guess, as a part of the group. I'm a, I'm a patient. Um, and our group are all members located here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So it's a great pleasure for us to be representing our group and our province in this webinar. Next slide, please. So we're going to provide a brief synopsis of our group, its work and accomplishments so far, and our experience as its members. If you have questions at any time, you can interrupt us with questions or comments in the chat, like Chelsea said, and we declare no conflict of interest at this time. So to start with, what is the public interest group on cancer research? It's a very successful public scientist collaboration in Newfoundland and Labrador. We were created in 2021 and currently have 11 public members who are either diagnosed with cancer or have family members diagnosed with cancer and three scientists. When the group was created, the founding members paid extra attention to diversity, inclusion and equity. Hence, we have a wide range of representation in terms of age, sex and geographic location. We also have representatives from the 2S LGBTQIA plus community Indigenous peoples, immigrants, non-white folks, and individuals affected by a variety of cancers. As you will see in the next slides, our group is very dynamic, successful, and productive. Next slide, please. So before getting into the details of our group and work, perhaps it could be good to remember why patient-scientist partnerships like our group are important and fill an important gap Everyone living in or working with knowledge generation and translation pathways, including researchers, healthcare providers, funders, policymakers, governments, need patient and public perspectives. Without public or patient perspectives, how can anyone truly solve problems and improve conditions in healthcare and other domains of life? Patients and family members come with lived experience that not only informs everyone, but also helps systems to change and improve. So patient partners, us, have a critical role in understanding, informing, and changing the circumstances. Next slide, please. With these things in mind, SevTap and a few other founding members initiated the steps to create the Public Interest Group on Cancer Research in 2021. When we were first created, we had two main focuses, 
creating and working on new cancer research projects and new public engagement projects together. We started the group with a mere $2,500 in funding from the Office of Public Engagement Quick Start Fund. It was a small fund, but enabled us to form this group. SEVTAP and the others widely advertised for the recruitment, and in a short time, they received 42 applicants from Newfoundland. Then a selection was done to select the final 12 public members who maximized the diversity, inclusion, and regions and cancers represented. So I can speak to why I applied. I had just finished uh, a year of cancer treatments and I was dealing with the after effects of, of the physical and mental stress and strain and changes. I was reading a lot about cancer. I was sharing a lot on, in my blog and on social media. Um, and I guess in some ways inching a little bit towards raising awareness and advocacy myself. When I saw the opportunity to get involved in this group, because a friend of mine sent me the info, I thought, wow, this is perfect. A group of people to help share this advocacy work and the ideas that I had with. So it was perfect for me on so many levels. So I, I right away, I think I did my application the day that I got the information about it. And it's been a wonderful experience ever since. Next slide, please. While our work has evolved over time, a few things have remained constant. For example, the partnership spirit that we have. We all work toward common goals enthusiastically, together, effectively, and with significant contributions. All 14 members of our public interest group bring something to the table, increase the diversity of ideas and activities, and work towards accomplishing the goals of the group. Our group has a very rich expertise, not only lived, but also research expertise. Together, we have been developing public outreach, public engagement, and advocacy expertise as well. Are there any questions in the chat at this point, or does anyone have anything they'd like to add or ask? I can't see. Is there anything there? I'm keeping an eye, Janine, and so far, uh, no hands up, No, nothing in the chat. Okay, perfect. So next slide, please. So with this brief introduction to the public interest group on cancer research, now I'd like to read out our objective in this presentation. We are here to share the work and experience of the public interest group that can inform other community member and scientist partnerships in oncology and possibly other fields as well. To do so, starting with the next slide, SEVTAP will provide examples of our group's activities and briefly go through member survey results. SEVTAP and I will also narrate our own experiences. So SEVTAP, take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Jenny. Can you hear me, folks? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for coming. And Jenny, this was an amazing presentation and introduction so far. Thank you. Um, as Jenny said, folks, uh, our uh, group is uh, diverse, our work is also diverse, and it's evolving constantly, but I think the main activities uh, can be summarized in this illustration that I created uh, a couple of days ago. Um, you will see that, you know, we, we do a lot of different kinds of activities. It's a very academic group, and except the classroom teaching, I think our group does everything an academician would do, and even more. And this is not surprising, considering the fact that every public member brings um, a wealth of personal and professional skills, knowledge, expertise, and perspectives, not only their lived experience, right? I mean, it's a reductionist to call them patient advisors or public members, but they, they do have a whole bunch of other skills and knowledge, and they bring it to the table. So it's a truly multidisciplinary um, team with a rich expertise. I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, it's not their lived experience, but they bring so much um, to our operations and work. This being said, uh, I think our group focuses on the five key domains of work, uh, developing and conducting cancer research projects, developing and delivering public engagement events and strategies, training and informing stakeholders and next generation scientists, creating and disseminating public as well as academic knowledge, both locally and globally, 
and advocacy on behalf of um, cancer affected persons and families. So starting with the next slide, I'm going to give you some specific examples of those. So, um, in terms of creating patient oriented research questions, when we first uh, created this group, our primary interest was to understand the patient and family um, priorities. So we had a number of group conversations, meetings, and at the end, we digested this information and discussion and we come up with 3 emerging points. Our patient um, or public members in the group emphasized that there was a need for better clinical care, accessible care and support to cancer patients and families. For example, those who need to travel from other parts of the province to San Jose, the capital city. That was, you know, so there's an excess issue here. In other parts on rural parts of Newfoundland and Labrador, there are excess issues and support may very much differ from one region to other. So that was one part. The other uh, very rich, uh, I think the highlighted issue or prior to was there was a need for better communication and information resources. Patients and families at the time of diagnosis and throughout the cancer trajectory from survivorship to treatment, they have a lot of the um, information needs about their diseases, uh, different uh, treatment options, maybe clinical trials, the support, psychological, social, financial, et cetera, support that are actually available to them through, for example, the provincial cancer care program. But many of this information, and it may change over time, right? It, uh, over time, different information may be needed, knowledge may be needed. But they seem like, you know, these uh, informations and communications were not in place uh, at this all the time or successfully. So that was one very highlighted priority. And the third one is, of course, uh, there was a need for better awareness by all stakeholders um, from governments to society to our neighbors to, you know, our schools and workplaces about the experiences and needs of cancer patients and families. And, you know, as a result, the patients and families could be empowered. So these uh, three main priorities uh, we identified, and I wanna just make a comment here is that two of them, the accessible uh, clinical care and support and information needs are actually two of the eight strategic priorities of the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. So that actually tells me that our group is able to capture the cancer control and patient priorities quite well. So, after this uh, work, we say that, okay, we can actually start doing something about this information needs. We said that we can start conversation and we applied for a funding when we uh, organized a very successful virtual public conference on cancer last year. So that was very successful. We had around 175 uh, registrants. We focused on three different topics from services uh, screening to you know, support services offered by the provincial cancer care program, uh, importance of partnering with the patients and families from uh, policy change to health research and healthcare, and of course, the perspectives of the cancer patients and families. So we had 16 speakers. It was a very vibrant, uh, very attentive uh, conference. We had great conversations going on. And of course, the patient and family speakers, um, they made the most, I think, a mark on everybody's memories. And we learned a lot of stuff along the way from both our attendees and speakers. Uh, we also implemented a survey, satisfaction survey, and our um, um, attend conference participants told us uh, or gave us really great ideas. They gave us ideas about other topics to talk about, for example, hospice care or others. And uh, we also noticed certain things along this uh, experience as well, for example, Almost 50% of our participants were from San Jose area. So, uh, so, you know, our, our, we thought that how can we reach out to other parts of the province better? I think we really need to do that. It's an equity, you know, equity problem. It's an excess problem. Uh, this is something that we are still uh, working on. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about this, but there were other things that we learned, for example, speaking for patient partners like jenny was one of them she she spoke incredibly during that um conference but for some other patient partners it was an emotional experience so rather than speaking alive we we solved this problem in consultation with them by record, pre-recording their conversations 
and there are other uh, there may be other uh, considerations as well for example for uh, we need to provide a safe environment for everyone, but for some vulnerable patients or speakers, for example, members of the 2S LGBTQA, we may not be able to do that in a virtual environment. So we had to, you know, we have to think about all of these things. So what happened is that uh, we published these and others uh, in an uh, article just the last day of August, I think this year. And if you are interested, then please go ahead and check this publication. Um, but one thing, as I said, you know, there are a lot of great ideas given to us. We have good perspectives and uh, good ideas. But one thing we really wanted to work on is how do we improve our outreach outside of the metro area, outside of St. John's, right? So this led to actually uh, developing a new project. So in this project, uh, uh, we wanted to um, develop a strategy, more effective strategy for outreach and public engagement in Newfoundland and Labrador. This was a one year public engagement project. It was called by John King, who is actually a member of our um, uh, group. And uh, we just submitted our manuscript uh, describing this work as well. So what did we do? We had conversations within our group. We look at the um, conference satisfaction survey responses. And then we also organized two public town halls, one in person, one virtual in May and June this year. We invited 26 individuals around from around um, Newfoundland and Labrador, including you know, healthcare providers, uh, advocates, um, and so on. So we learned a number of things and this, uh, whatever we have learned, we put in our manuscript, as I said, we submitted it, but I think at the end, what I want to emphasize here is that there are things that we want to do based on this uh, knowledge we gained in this project. So we have a number of recommendations for our group and we also have a number of recommendations for external stakeholders, especially government and healthcare system in case they are listening and I hope they will. And one thing I really want to add, uh, mention is that we really need a provincial, uh, pro, you know, province-wide engagement network. What does this mean? This is not about you know organizing a virtual event and in-person event, but it's really about also informing individuals in every part of the province about the uh, events, um, uh, you know, webinars, discussions, or any other um, uh, public-oriented activities. So I'm hoping that maybe uh, and I'll support as some um, activities in this direction as well, because I know man had, you know, this uh, community hubs, which is great. They just opened. I think there are around 8 different uh, offices around Newfoundland and Labrador with, with rooms equipped with technology to allow individuals to participate in virtual events, which is great. But there are, this is a great start and I think it's an amazing start, but we, we really need to do more. And this such a network would also be, you know, very useful for the researchers because every recruitment, every promotion, event promotion, study promotion, study recruitment, they are very, very fragmented and sometimes very slow and also expensive um, activities. I think it would really help everyone at that. Chasa, do you have a question? Not a question, but I'll just comment quickly on that sub tap that, you know, we are always trying to to do better at NL support. We're always trying to do better uh, engagement, as you know, and trying to learn from all the great researchers that we that we um, partner with yeah. and how they're, what they're learning about engagement. And Holly and I were just involved in a session within the university about public engage the public engagement framework process in the university. Yeah. Uh, and that was a huge takeaway from that session. Um, that we need to be better integrated across the university with how we're doing public engagement. So we definitely have some plans in the new year to to make strides on that. All right, that's great news. And I think there is a need and uh, you will definitely have our support to do that. Yes, we need the provincial network. I, I fully agree. Anyhow, so, so that's great. And we are really looking forward to some progress in this area because I think it's kind of a benefit to everyone. But in the meantime, of course, we, you know, our recommendations because we want, you know, we, we need to, as a group, we also need to reach out to more collaborations, you know, uh, for better collaborations or maybe wider collaborations, etc. And we have been working on some of these recommendations. 
which is really great. So first thing first, we actually reached out and made a new collaboration with Quadrangle, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador. This is a local 2S LGBTQA uh, community. So we just got funded to actually have a documentary screening and panel discussion event uh, about transgender, transgender individuals with cancer. So uh, we are partnering with the Quadrangle NL for this, uh, nicely funded by Office of Public Engagement again. And we just set the date yesterday for May 16th. It will be a virtual event. Hopefully we all will uh, attend to it. Uh, just save the date for now. And another uh, new project uh, we developed was, you know, we wanted to continue to um, create public information about cancer, cancer experiences, cancer support programs, screening, and so on. So uh, this is a project just funded by, and also co-developed uh, with another public member in the group, Jason Wiseman, and Janine is also involved in that. And what are we going to do? We are going to do uh, some great uh, public resources on cancer podcasts. So we will try, we will get our hands on podcasting and we have a very talented undergrad assistant helping us right now, Kayla. Hopefully we will be able to do this and invite some guests and um, and have some podcasts and other conversation sessions um, and or video messages or guest blog posts. Again, the idea is to, you know, continue to make a cancer public uh, information, um, public knowledge, public conversation topic, which I believe will help us to less fear diseases, more talk about it, more think about it, and maybe, you know, more take more control. So uh, the teams, of course, as you can imagine, anything related to cancer, cancer lived experiences, perspectives, healthcare, and so on. Uh, but we really would like to have different perspectives, including from healthcare um, perspectives, because you know uh, it's really important. They they work in a different way than we assume. Um, I think yeah, it is in my experience. They have different restrictions. And different guidelines. So I'm really looking forward to you know inviting at this one um, healthcare provider or leader to understand how uh, the healthcare services uh, are actually decided and how they change. Because I, after all, our group is also very interested in changing, but we don't know how the healthcare and other systems can change. So I'm really looking forward to that. So. Um, yeah, in addition to all of this, we also, you know, generate and publish uh, public and academic knowledge about cancer as well as public engagement. This is really interesting because I'm a cancer scientist, lab rat, and then later computer person. And now I'm all of a sudden in the last two, three years, I'm also publishing about the public engagement, which is amazing. So we published two studies, uh, two pa academic papers already. We submitted our third one. So that means every year, and we just, you know, we are created in 2021, so it's only two and a half years. So that means every every year we actually, our group is actually creating a new academic manuscript, which is really amazing. We also, you know, present our work in the academic conferences at MAN, et cetera. Like in, in the last two years, we made a number of uh, conference presentations. In one of them, our public members were speakers. So, you know, they are, um, they are an active part of these uh, academic conferences and, and presentations as well. And we also do, you know, uh, we also connect with our public. It's really very important for us to create a public and publicly uh, accessible as well as understandable knowledge about cancer. So we are very active in local media in terms of radio interviews and articles. And we not only, you know, um, talk about our work um, and report back to community, but we also, you know, advocate for others uh, affected by cancer. For example, one of our members says we should really do something about these delays in the cancer care because of the you know, the first year of the pandemic. So, you know, uh, we got together and uh, wrote an article about that. And this is just one example of our advocacy. And of course, you know, having a scientist and a patient advocate in the same radio program or an article, it just, you know, it's such a complementary perspective. It just makes it so much enrich real conversation. So I'm really thankful for all our uh, public members who are involved in our public communications. 
Janine is one of them. She's great. Uh, and he, sorry. Sorry, Subtap, I see we have a question come in here in the chat, if you don't mind pausing for a second. Yeah. Uh, so it's from Teresa. Teresa says, your work is so amazing. I have a question about the level of public engagement in your project. What is their involvement level? Uh, and they're using the um, International Association of Public Participation, public participate, well, my words are <laughs> my words are coming out right. Public participate participation spectrum. Uh, so inform, consult, involve, collaborate, or empower. Okay, great. So I have a I have a slide a little bit talking about that. So I'll get to that if that's okay, okay Teresa. Okay. Right. Um so in terms of you know reaching out to public and others we also created our website so we have guest blogs and some of the useful resources and uh advocacy activities strengthening communicate community and we also have an annual newsletter now this is our second year every january we we uh circulated for public access as well as to you know relevant units like in our support discipline of oncology at man the ca provincial cancer care program leadership in nl health services and so on so this is for uh this year and i'm going to circulate it on january and usually this is around the six seven pages long um documents telling about who we are what we have uh achieved and and so on so, in many different ways, we are trying to reach out to the stakeholders and public. And this may be, Teresa, is something um, uh, related to your question. Uh, but before that, you know, our members also help us to train next generation scientists. How do they do it? For example, uh, John King and I were invited to give a talk about public outreach uh, in a training workshop uh, last month, no, in, in October. So we talk about, you know, um, how to reach out the pub, how public or patient partnership works, our experience and so on. So it was for training. So we got a lot of great comments and questions that was really cool. And in terms of cancer research, and this is directly related to what Teresa is saying. So some of our members are directly involved in our um, studies as investigators and patient partners, right? So, um, Two of one of them is ongoing, for example, this one, and we have two patient partners here and one of them even helped our uh, student to have a mock interview so that they can get a good uh, practice prior to actually working with the real set of participants. So it's another example of how they help us and then um, help train the next generations. And as you may remember that we, in the 1st year, we worked on our information needs uh, is it's one of the 3 priorities of the uh, patients and families. So, we developed a proposal uh, that are writing 1 or 2 part. Um, yeah, uh, patient um, partners in there. They have been involved from beginning and it's under. Review right now, we are hoping that it will be funded soon so that we can do that. And of course, there is a, another 1 just funded. Um, we have 1 of our members as a patient partner here with the lived experience. On pediatric cancers, so, um. Sorry it's about here. Yeah, so they most of the time they start from the beginning, especially with the information is proposal. We involve them from the beginning on. Right. And in some others, they were, per, for example, this one, I think, yeah, this one is a continuation of another previous study of mine. So they kind of are integrated after we design it, but they do help us from uh, everything um, from uh, documents to the recruitment to the bringing the patient centering approach to the study. Does that answer, Teresa, your question? I hope so. Thank you. Okay, so you know our um, our members do a, a lot of different things, right? So again, I mean, you will see this, and we also, you know, sometimes we are consulted about certain things, like, um, for example, a group in uh, NL Health Services consulted us about a certain needs of the patients uh, and families, and we provided this information to them, not we, but you know, the the patient partners in our comments. So we do a lot of different things. 
And I think none of this would be possible without the motivation and interest of our public and scientists members in the group. Like we have to really acknowledge everyone uh, is doing such a great job. And mind that we were created during the pandemic. So many of us have not even um, met in person. So there are, there are a lot of great things about this group and our bond I think is really, is, is really strong. At least um, for me, but what I see is that it's also a great connection between our at least public members as well. So that's amazing. And finally, I want to say something. Uh, people who work with me, they they will know that I don't like to brag about my work and accomplishments, but this group is an exception. I think this group is doing exceptionally uh, in so many different ways, and I'm very proud of being a part of it and working with these folks. So this is what I wanna say at this point. Is there any other question, comments so far? Okay, all right. So with this, we are going to talk about our experience now. Janine, do you wanna take it over? Sure, yeah, I can, I can do that. Okay. So every year, the public members in the group complete a satisfaction survey around November, December. And the survey asks us about our thoughts on our work, the environment and operations, and our experiences to improve and experiences that we cherish. Um, so in the past two years, the satisfaction reported was very high. This slide you can see shows some of the comments made by our members. So everyone is easy to talk to and it feels like a safe place. I think everybody really feels that way. It feels comfortable and safe. And it was set up that way right from the first time we met. Uh, somebody asked to meet more frequently, and then I believe we added in some uh, extra meetings. Um, participating in this group has been an opportunity to bring meaningful effort to the cancer journey by contributing effort and ideas. So everybody, it gives us a chance to feel that we can bring our experiences forward to help contribute to future things, future research projects, future supports for patients or, or anything else. Um, from my own perspective, I can say, um, not only has it been a safe place, it's been a place where I could share the burden of doing advocacy work and raising awareness because it can be very, very exhausting and not necessary, of course, for a cancer survivor to do that kind of thing. I felt like doing it because I had such a unique cancer experience. I was fairly young. My surgeon joked with me that I wasn't as young as I thought I was, but I was 42 when I was diagnosed with stage three rectal cancer. And I had a very, um, my treatment plan was very invasive. I had radiation. I had uh, you know, surgery, a very difficult surgery with a permanent colostomy and six months of chemo. So the whole thing took a year. I, the things I was left with, though, were so different from the things I heard being talked about, about cancer after effects. So as a 42 year old, I went into immediate sudden menopause from my treatments. I had to learn how to navigate a colostomy and I've done that quite well. And I I actually uh, use a technique now that allows me to just wear basically a bandage on my stoma. So I feel like these are things I like to share because other people can benefit and, it, and people don't talk about it. So I felt compelled to make these things mentionable, to talk about treating menopause and cancer survivors, to spread the proper information about it because there's a lot of misinformation and to talk about it's okay to have a colostomy and to look for help in managing it. Um, and the mental health after effects was the third thing that I felt strongly um, about bringing forward. Doing that myself in a blog was great, but also draining. Doing that as a part of a group where other people could bear some of the responsibility for, for the organization setting things up, you know, sharing information, and they had their own things to bring forward and advocate that they felt strongly about that they wanted to spread awareness on. And I could help them. So just sharing that burden 
in this group has been so fulfilling and such a relief. So that's my perspective. I, when I told Sev Tap that the other day, she said, oh, I never really thought about it like that. So I really thought it was important to mention that, that the team effort helps survivors do the advocacy piece if that's important to them or do the communication piece if that's important to them. So that is my experience. I'm going to pass it over to Sev Tap now. All right. Thank you, Janine. Yes. I think we need to hear more about our members um, experiences. This way we can learn more. It was really an eye opener when Janine told me about her experiences. I was like, I never knew. So thanks for sharing it, Janine, again. Thank you so much. I know there are others who, who would like to share as well. And now, if I may, you know, tell you about my experience as an academician or scientist and advocate, um, you know, I mean, I knew about NL support, patient oriented research, you know, efforts, a focus. And I remember maybe four or five years ago, uh, meeting with a lovely uh, staff, Ava. Um, and she gave me this sheet about, you know, this is how you can integrate patient partners in everything you do. It's like, I'm looking at it and I'm still looking at it. I, I did look at it for months actually. And I said, there is no way that I can actually work with the patient partners because my job is in the lab and then, you know, very statistical, computational. It's really great. Like I'm interested in uh, medical outcomes of cancer patients. So it really is, uh, is something is patient oriented. However, it's very technical. So it's like, how am I going to actually integrate any patient partners in my research? So since I wasn't able to do that, and after a while, you know, I parted, but then during the pandemic, pandemic really helped me to see things differently, by the way. And so I say, you know what, if I can integrate patient partners in my current research interest, maybe I can develop a new <laughs> interest, scholarly interest, and this is how we can work. And this is how that happened. One day I emailed, you know, Catherine Street from NL Support. Hey, I want to create a, a patient advisory group on uh, cancer. Can you set me your, you know, terms of reference or other stuff that I have no idea about, but can give me an idea. And then she connected me with Holly, Holly Echegaray, and then, you know, we just take it from there. It was amazing. So, and I thought, I always thought my P PhD years were the best time of my career, but now I kind of think that, no, this is the work that we do as part of this group is the most meaningful and valuable part of my scholarly uh, career. So thank you everyone. It's very productive. It's also very flexible. I want to emphasize on this. I don't know how, why we are so productive, but we are doing great. But I think it's because everybody is really a focus on the objectives. It's a real objective to help others to reduce the suffering by cancer and so on. We are flexible. This is very important. We are uh, right now 14 people. We were up to 80 people at one time. But I, I thought this needs to be... Uh, mentioned we can't expect our public members to be there for us all the time it, you know our work is not this work is not the priority for them maybe I, I this is my observation maybe it is life happens i mean during the last two and a half years some of our members lost their child to cancer some of them lost their parents to you know cancer um some of them went through, you know, scan anxiety. A couple of our members go through active treatment. I mean, can you really expect, you know, can you really expect our work to be the most important thing in their life? No. So we are very flexible. So some of our members are very interested in research. Some of our members are very interested in public engagement. Some of our uh, members are very interested in other aspects of our work. So maybe that's why, you know, our, our work is so diverse. Everybody has something to do. So that's, that's I think, needs to be uh, emphasized. The other things I want to say is we are very reflexive. We learn as we go um, from our experiences. And that's important and responsive. Responsive means it's not about me, you know, creating a research project question all the time, you know, as a lead of this group. No, it's about, you know, what are the needs uh, and wishes of the everyone in the group? Right? So we are talking about the true partnership here. In true partnership, you have to be responsive. 
you have to be collaborating. So it's not about just creating a research project here. It's about what our members are also asking. For example, some of them ask us to write um, uh, uh, articles uh, raising awareness about certain things. We will do that. We should do that. You know, it's, it's, it's required. And I think the other thing is academic freedom. Very, very important. Uh, we have the academic freedom. We can talk about anything and uh, we can criticize anything, anyone. We don't care. I personally don't care because my focus is, you know, advocating for the patients and families. And that also means that we, we are free to create information. We are free to create whatever we want to do. And it's, you know, I think it's really amazing. And the other thing I want to say, and I've been really thinking about this, it needs to be a win-win. Again, being flexible, reflexive, responsive. Um, you know, we, we work as a group, but, you know, I think we have done a good job um, forming a relationship and we should continue to do that. And this power structure, I hope is not there, but I'm always aware that because I'm a scientist, I'm leading this group. Is there a power um, and balance here? We need to make it a win-win situation. I'm hoping, you know, having a trusting and open conversation among our group, which we have been trying to do is a good indication that that can happen. Uh, but this is something that I always think about, like we gain a lot. I gain a lot of meaning and the satisfaction by working by this group, but is it the same for the every member? So this is just something for me to reflect. Um, so, yeah, and in conclusion, folks, I think we talk about a lot of stuff. This is a great, um, community, um, very productive, very interested in very complementary expertise. Um, we advocate, we, uh, you know, work on ca cancer research projects. We develop a lot of public engagement projects together. We constantly evolve. I don't know what we are going to do in the next 2 years, but I think. Uh, I want to also emphasize this part, like Janine and I independently come up with the same things. Beside everything else, you know, an indicator of success. These are also very important, right? This group is an opportunity for me and for Janine, I guess, right? Janine, correct me if I am wrong. Was an opportunity for us to grow? Yes, 100%. Mm -hmm. Heal and give back to the community. So we can talk about all the indicators that, they, you know, everybody wants us to get academically, you know, success, this and that, but I mean, seriously, this is something, but how about this? How can you put a price on this? This is amazing. Amazing, amazing experience. So I just want to emphasize on that. Right, Janine? Yes, here, here. <laughs> here, here. Okay. And, and this is our last uh, slide. And I think time wise, we are doing okay. You know, um, we couldn't do it alone. We had a lot of support and funding uh, and a lot of people actually were involved. We had six funding members. Two of them are actually um, uh, public members, uh, Doug Smith and Rebecca um, Room. Uh, so we thank everyone who, you know, contributed to this group without them seriously, we couldn't be here where we are. Office of Public Engagement, man, uh, they have been a great funder. They have funded our projects for the fourth year, and thanks to them, we can keep going. And Discipline Oncology is supporting us uh, sometimes financially as well, but and our support as well. Like you have been there from the beginning on. The beginning, the first email that I sent to Catherine Street about, you know, I want to create this. Uh, patient advisor committee on cancer. You have been there all the time for us. And Holly, of course, is an amazing uh, part of the committee as being the academic public engagement lead of NL support. So we, we thank everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you all the um, audience. And if you have any questions, uh, we will be very happy to take them now. Thank you so much, Septab and Janine. That was uh, fascinating, and I can't speak for all of NL support, but uh, you know, we always love hearing about, about this project and about the work that this group is doing. Because uh, truly, personally, for myself, it's such a great learning experience. So um, the tables really flipped. We're learning from you now. You know, <laughs> you're doing such <laughs> great work, and uh, and it's wonderful to see. So. 
as Septem said, if, if anyone has any questions, uh, please feel free to use the chat or raise your hand and I can unmute you. And I can get the, the ball rolling. So um, I just want to go back to something Janine was talking about. And Janine, thank you so much for uh, for sharing some of your experiences with us. I think you really hit the nail on the head about the difference between how patients view um, their experiences on a specific topic compared to how researchers view the experience, because you were talking about your uh, your outcome outcome measures that would be important to you in terms of, you know, um, having to go into early menopause or having to have a colostomy. And then SEMTAP, I thought it was funny because you talked about how it, it this world of public patient and public engagement seems so foreign to you because you were uh, previously involved only on medical outcomes. <laughs> So it's just funny how, you know, how there's a, those two sides to the story, but actually if you bring them both together, I think, I think that's really the benefit of, of patient engagement is that we're, we're able to say, yeah, those medical outcomes are important, but, um, but, you know, we forgot to think about the fact that, yeah, this person survived, that's great, but how has their life changed because of this, you know? Exactly. Uh, Holly, been... you, Holly, you said you have, you have a comment. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry. See if that works for you. Member of this group, of course, love working with Janine and Sevtap. So thank you to you both for once again presenting on this group because it really is part of our mandate, isn't it? To try to raise awareness and share the word, etc. Uh, I will just say very quickly, but then I'll make my comment that I call Sevtap our fearless leader. Uh, and it's true. You really do need somebody with passion and energy. And uh, Seb Dab is certainly that person. So I want to say that publicly. She's very modest, but it's true. But the thing that I'm reflecting on, I've reflected on many of the same things that both Janine and Seb Tap have thought about just from being a part of this group. But in terms of this audience and this webinar and thinking about patient engagement more broadly, one of the things that strikes me today, um, just listening to, to us talk, and I should know this because I'm a member of the group, I actually think this group really does demonstrate some best practices for patient engagement more broadly. So the idea of offering choice and flexibility in level of engagement, that is something we do routinely. SEVTAP will say, okay, everyone, you know, I'd love for someone to co-present this uh, webinar with me, no pressure. All right, everyone, which if you like your name that help us work on the telegram article. Great. Let us know. Okay, everyone, if you want to be a co investigator on this project, that project. So that really works well. And I think Septap, you're right that that increases the diversity of what we do. Right? The other yeah. thing, the idea of trying to implement an evaluation, even a simple 1, just a 1 yearly little bit of a survey. Reflecting on that and making changes as necessary. I think in patient engagement work, we often don't take the time to do routine evaluation. So I actually think that's been a good thing as well. So I just thought today it just reminded me of, oh, those are some of the best practices for patient engagement. So that was a good reminder. So it's not really a question, just a comment. I think some good takeaways for others who want to do patient engagement, right? Well, Thank you, Holly. As always, great, great points. And you know, the more I think about it, the more I mean, other ideas are coming. Like, I think, uh, I think we will write more papers now. <laughs> Always papers to be written, as you know. <laughs> well, we have to write it so that we can share it. I think yeah. the more we write it, the better we understand. The better we understand, we write, the better, you know, it's just a, this, yeah. you know, circle. You write, you understand, you write, you understand, yeah. and then you share it. So, I, um, like, even with, I think, Janine, her, when I first heard about her slide that she showed today, Janine, do you remember what I said? I encourage her to write her uh, experience as a patient partner, public uh, uh, partner in our group. You know, and maybe submit to an academic journal. Why not? I mean, she 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 has been a part of this. She has brought uh, you know so much to our group, but she also. Uh, has her own perspectives that I didn't know, and which is very, very, you know, um, important. And now I'm mumbling, but what I'm trying to say is that it's a great, great team. The more we speak, the more, uh, the better we get, and the more we write, the more we can say. Thank you. 
Can you have anything you want to add to that? Oh, I was just actually writing a little comment there, but I'll just say it out loud. Uh, that's so true, Holly, what you said, so many best practices, and I've learned a lot from being a part of this group. Um, and I'm glad you reflected that because I hadn't even really thought about some of those things until you said them. And I was also writing that I really agree with you. Um, Sevtap is a fearless leader who is so energetic and prolific and, you know, she can put together a, an article or a presentation and just pull so many people into it. And it's amazing. And having her kind of leading everybody and pulling everybody together is so, that's such a, I don't even know what to call it, such a blessing, I guess, such a gift. So thank you, Sevtap. And thank you for this opportunity. And thank you to the people who tuned in. It was great to be here today. Thank you, Janine. Thank you, Janine. We have a couple of more comments and questions in the chat. Um, so Carolyn says, I love this model of community engagement and research. Congratulations. Congratulations to all of you who are making this group and your activities so successful. Uh, and Teresa asks if there's a way for um, for graduate students to engage with the public interest group on cancer research if they're interested in doing patient oriented research. Right, so certainly we have been uh, uh, approached by other groups as well. So um, um, again, if our members are interested in, they do, uh, they can be involved in as patient partners. So what we suggest is that they send us an information about the study and, and we can circulate it to our group members. And if anybody is interested in, uh, they will be a part of, they can be a part of uh, the project. So for sure, yeah. And Septap, do you mind, uh, usually I do a follow-up after these sessions. So do you mind if I include your email in that follow-up in case somebody does want to reach out in that oh, regard? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to put it here as well. This is my oh, email, right. so I said Manda CA folks, and you can, uh, you know, contact us anytime. Again, we it's our members choice. If they're interested in, they are interested in. If they are not and they don't have time, that's fine. But we can always work on things. We can at least inform them. If there is an interest, they will be there. They are very dedicated individuals. Wonderful. Are there any other questions? Maybe I can ask another one quickly. I, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how you recruited for diversity in the group. Because I know oh, we have... That's something that we're always trying to get better at with our patient and public advisory council. Right. So um, we were very lucky. So in three, so so we put it one of like we had it as one of the aims, right? We just did the one one part like St. John's. No, I mean it's it's okay. It's a, it's a representation of St. John's, but it's not a representation of Newfoundland and Labrador. This is just one geographic diversity point, right? Or, or only white, or you know, how about indigenous individuals? How about these vulnerable individuals such as you know LGBTQ members or you know non-white individuals? And 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 maybe even you know the age-wise as well, like seniors, young individuals, and so on. So everybody can have different experiences depending on where they live, which kind of cancer they have been affected by, whether they were diagnosed with cancer themselves or they had a family member you know, uh, diagnosed with cancer. So we thought about all of this. Everybody's experiences may be different, but we, we can get a representation. So we made it an aim to have a diverse and inclusive group. What does this mean? I mean, we are not 100% inclusive because we are virtually meeting. We we know that we are actually missing a couple, you know, folks who may not have access to a reliable, you know, phone servers or internet servers, or they are not able to, you know, use or utilize computers or other devices to actually participate our uh, meetings. But to our best, we tried, right? So we made it one of our aims and we said that, you know, we are not going to accept everyone to our group because we need a manageable number like 12 is good. But we really encourage everyone, to, especially from these groups, from rural areas, this and that, to uh, make an application. So we got 42 applications in three weeks, right? And among those, then we did a selection, a selection in terms of maximizing the diversity. For example, we still have most of our members are from Eastern Health region, 
right? Like uh, members like Jenny who are from Western or Central, and we have one, for example, amazing member from Labrador, but we really needed to, you know, but we can't have more, right? We can have more from Central, uh, Western and Labrador, um, and we have more women than men. And I think this is somehow known that we, women are more interested in, I think, uh, being a uh, committee um, members or speaking, I don't know, but so we wanted to maximize. We asked them certain questions when they make an application so that we can use this information to maximize the diversity. It's tough because I'm creating another public advisor committee right now. I have 15 uh, applicants from Atlantic Canada um, and diversity is not there. So we will have to keep going and maybe reach out. Uh, to specific groups or organizations to recruit those. So it's always tough, but it's doable. Definitely. Well, I mean, this group is, is evidence that it's doable, I think. And I think even, you know, as you said, you have to keep your group size manageable. So some of your public engagement efforts and your dissemination efforts and the, the you know, innovative ways that you're doing that kind of thing helps to reach some of the people that you might not include in that advisory body. So that's also excellent, I think. Right. For example, I mean, we, we recruited our lab current Labrador member uh, because they were very active during our public conference on cancer. We said, oh, my God, you should join us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you should join us because they are active. They are invested. They, they are participating and uh, they did. And I, I'm, I'm very glad. But I think uh, um, I think we just need to. And I think it's really important to provide a safe environment, though. Right. A safe environment where people everyone will feel safe, valued, accepted. So, um, and we just encourage everyone. And so far, we, our group has been amazing, really. Amazing. I see we've, we're just about at time here. So uh, if there's any last comments or questions, I'll, I'll take those now. Again, feel free to, to raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted. Not seeing anything, but uh, Septep has kindly put her her email there in the in the chat, and I'll be following up via email, um, likely next week. And I just want to say again, thank you so much, Janine, and thank you, Septep, for for doing this session for us. It was excellent, uh, excellent to hear about the work that you're doing and and to learn more about it. And we look forward to learning more about it in your newsletter in January. So yes, um, so we'll hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for having us. This is amazing. And thank you folks for joining us today. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.